Welcome back to the Agent Investor Podcast. I've got a special guest uh, three hours behind me on the West Coast in Seattle, uh, Beth Traverso. Beth, how's it going today? Going great, Tom. Thanks so much for having me on here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I know I got you know some notes ahead of time and I talked to you a little bit briefly, but tell us a little bit about how you got involved in real estate close to, I guess, at 20 years at this point, right? Right. So I got my real estate agent, real estate agent license back in 1998 and I bought my first investment property in 2002. So I've been, I'm coming up close to 20 years investing about 20, 23 years, uh, as an agent. Um, so, and I, I you know, it does kind of go hand in hand, like, a, you know, because we are, how I got started in real estate basically was, I have to go way back, but there, yeah. I was fortunate enough to connect with Good the great, time. Okay. I was just like, where do I start here? There's so many layers to this story. I could literally talk for hours. So I'm trying to pick and choose like what's going to be the best way to start this story. So I was fortunate enough when I started selling real estate that I partnered with another real estate agent um, on the sales side. Mm -hmm. We worked as, as a partnership team, I guess you'd say, although teams really weren't what they are today back then. Nope. Um, and he was an investor and he showed me all the benefits of investing and I saw what he was doing. And when we had our first good year where we made some decent money, um, you know, he was very direct with me. He's just like, don't do anything else until you buy a rental property. Like just mm -hmm. take your money, buy a rental property, then go have fun or do whatever else you're going to do. So Thankfully, I had that like nudge to get me going. And I did. I took the plunge and I bought a house or, you know, it was a rundown house in Seattle that had already been a rental for 40 years by the time I got it and you know, purchased, purchased it back in 2002 for 249,000, which is really low price for Seattle. Um, just got my foot in the door, you know, and I made every mistake and learned all kinds of things and, uh, you know. Some of those, uh, I wouldn't say it was like a slam dunk home run first deal, but it certainly is something that I'll always appreciate just because it, it started me going and got me feeling a little more confident and knowing that, okay, I can do this. You know, I had some challenges, survived those challenges, ended up selling it many years later and trading it into something else for far more than I purchased it for. Um, and just got some experience under my belt. So that was the first, my first, uh, step into the world of investing back then. Yeah, no, I think you, you know, one point that you made that I think is really important is like, you said you didn't get a great deal on your first property. And I think some people, some people wait, they think, oh, I need to get this incredible deal. But what you had said, I totally agree with. It's like, it's more about the confidence that you can actually invest yeah. whatever you do. Right. And obviously now looking back, you know, 20 years later, in hindsight, I don't care what you're buying in Seattle in the twos you can't get anything you can't get i know it really i think it's more important that you decide than what you decide and of course nobody wants to make a foolish decision and go way out and buy something really ridiculous but i mean really like you, i could have bought it doesn't matter if maybe i should have bought that house for 220 instead of 250 like i honestly don't care at this point it doesn't matter um what does matter is just starting and even still like in a high price market where we are the really great, great deals. Um, you know, I, I always tell people like, it seems more like a, a good fair deal is a good deal. Mm -hmm. Like finding something that's like every once in a while, you'll get something will just fall in your lap as an agent. That's just like, wow, I can't believe this just happened. It's so great. But that those are few and far between. And I do think that if people are waiting for that perfect scenario to line up, because they read that it's supposed to be this equation before you can, you know, if it doesn't meet this number threshold or whatever, then, you know, it's not a good deal and it has, it must cash flow this percentage of the purchase price or what, you know, all these different rules that people have. And I think the most important thing, like you were saying, is just get out there and get started. And, um, you know, even, like I said, even if, even if it's not great, if it's, like that deal I bought, I remember it didn't cash flow at all in the beginning. You know, I think my pay, my payment was pretty much exactly what the rent was. Um, and it needed all kinds of work and there was tenant challenges and everything else. Cause I didn't know what I was doing and I was self-managing, but, um, you know, looking back on it, it's like, 
really none of that mattered because it was just the catalyst to get things started. So, nice. so yeah, even backing up a little bit. So what, what got you to even go into real estate to begin with? Yeah. So I was feeling kind of directionless. I never, and I'm, I'm one of those people that never had like a quote unquote real job. Like real estate was always my job. I, I didn't go to college. I was just kind of drifting. I needed, I, but I knew I had a lot of ambition and I knew that I could build something, but I just didn't know how to do it. And I did, you know, thankfully I bought my first house in, in Seattle that I lived in a few years before I bought that rental house. Um, and that there was a lot of lessons learned there too, but that process of buying that before I got my license, it just kind of got me fired up for the, the hunt and the search and helping people get on the, uh, property ladder and just get started building equity and adding value. Like I started, and I guess that is investing in its own way too. Although like your house that you live in is not necessarily, I mean, it's an investment in that it's an asset, but it's, and there's ways to improve value, et cetera, but it's not like a, you know, cash flowing rental. But mm -hmm. just getting getting on that started me um, uh, in on the real estate sales track. Um, once I got into my house, I was helping my friends. I'm was, I was, I was so excited. I was only 21 years old at the time. And I was like, hey, this is really possible. Let's get out here and do this. You, all my friends like, you need to do this too. Like, this is so great. Yep. And so I was helping them find houses. And then they're like, okay, well, now I need an agent to help me buy it. Do you have an agent? And I was like, oh, well, maybe that's something I could do. So it just kind of seemed like the natural progression of things and uh never looked back yeah no i hear that story a lot where people you know get sparked from buying their own property sometimes i hear people say my agent was so bad that that actually catapulted me into yeah. saying i should be an agent um so right. yeah. but um so so you were were selling friends and families homes and then you said that someone that was a developer that you were friendly with ended up kind of pushing you to do your first investment deal right yeah, he wasn't really a developer, but more okay. just like a very like an entrepreneurial investor type yep. of person. Very creative, good with making connections and relationships and being resourceful. And just, it kind of opened my mind to like thinking like, this is possible. You know, he can do it. I can do it. We're not that different. Um, and um, so around 2002 was also the time I met my uh, uh, future husband around that time also. Um, and he is a, a contractor and he also had a house that he had bought and then he had one rental property too. So it was kind of like, oh, wow, we're like already synced on all of that. So then, you know, he and I partnered up as far as like, well, in more ways than one, obviously we got married and we were buying, buying other properties and he fixes them and I find them. It's kind of like we have our roles, um, and just finding that other person to, uh, take that um and just kind of combine forces and you know it feels like a snowball when you have the right partner but i also don't want anybody listening to this to think that they can't do it if they don't have a partner that's you know as equally invested in real estate you know but um i know for me it really was key for us you know when we join forces it really um still to this day really helps us uh, achieve a lot more than we could you know if i was just trying to do it on my own yeah. Well, I know in my business, like I have a, I have a business partner, they handle all the construction side. I do all the sales and marketing. Um, but like you said, you don't need to have a partner because you don't need to have a partner to fill that void. I mean, not everybody can do every piece. Not everybody has the finances. Not everybody has the construction background. Not everybody has the sales and marketing. And as somebody who's building out, you need to find people that can kind of fill, fill those seats. Um, <clears throat> so you bought your first deal, you were kind of break even um, and now after you did that first deal, or you bought that first rental property, did that like motivate you to do more? Did you have any like struggles or any hesitations like of, about doing more after you bought your first rental? How did that go? Yeah, well, I mean, there definitely were, uh, ups and downs, but it was very exciting to see the value going up. I mean, I'm in a high appreciating market, so it was really, really cool to just watch that value just ex explode over can I just ask you, what would that property be worth today if you sold it? Probably about a million dollars. <laughs> so. so I I knew it was yeah. going to be high, and I I wanted yeah. just I wanted to make that point to make a point yeah. because in one way, twenty years is a really long time. In another area, I can if you're like me, like I feel like twenty years ago was kind of like yesterday. 
I know it's really and not that it doesn't feel long ago at all. It's crazy how it really doesn't feel that long ago. So I started in my career 16 years ago in real estate. And so like it, it goes by quick. And so yeah. like for, for most people, like a 20, a 20 year horizon can almost guarantee that you're going to get big appreciation Yeah. In a, in a two year window in a one year window in a four year window, it can be tough, but 20 mm-hmm. years is huge. Now you paid again, what, two and a quarter for that? I paid 249 or something, 250, we'll call it. Yeah. So so one one deal, and this is something that we I preach all the time, one deal can change your life. And that yeah. one deal is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars, three quarters of a million dollars of appreciation. And that's one deal. So I'm sorry I interrupted you, but um, so you're telling about like how that kind of first property was going. Yeah. And so um also it, it's, it was a springboard to help me purchase other properties too. Cause once that equity started to go up, you know, you just, you know, within a couple of years, I kind of got my feet wet, got things figured out, improved the property, got better renters in there, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, I was able to get a line of credit on it and then use that line of credit to purchase other rental properties. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like you can use one, you've got to be careful to not over leverage, Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, within, you know, within, you know, certain limitations, you know, it's, I think it's perfectly fine to pull out some of that cash to purchase other properties. So, I mean, of course I, I put my own money in it too. Some people don't like to, they try to not use their own money, but I don't mind putting some of my own money into a deal, but, you know, we purchased several other, um, you know, starter home, mostly like single family starter home in the Seattle suburbs. We, we bought two or three of those um, using, uh, lines of credit from that house and other houses that we own. Cause we owned our own personal, you know, residences as well. So, yep. and then when we, uh, you know, moved in together after getting married, then, you know, we kept the other ones for rentals, you know, like the primaries became rental properties. Yep. Um, and then, you know, as time goes on, some of these properties provide opportunities. So like when 2008 hit that hit us like a ton of bricks, like a lot of people, um, thankfully we had enough resources from our investments that we were able to ride out that storm. Basically the rental properties helped us get through that. Um, we had a property. Uh, tell me about, tell me about that. How did the rental properties, cause everyone always says like market goes down, like if I own rental property is going to be really bad. And you just said that it helped you. So how did it happen? The rental property? Yeah. Help you? First of all, you only take a <laughs> loss when you sell. So we didn't sell during that time. Um, so it didn't, doesn't really matter that it went, we were underwater for a while on some of these properties, but not, we still have them, most of them. And they're, they're still, they're doing great. So, but how we, one of them was subdividable and we had, been, we had started working on the subdividing process before 2008 hit. And then when it did, we had two lots that we could uh, sell off. Um, now granted it was a terrible time to sell lots, but Hey, we were able to get an extra couple hundred thousand dollars from selling these lots that got us through the hard times, you know? So when we still had the rental house that was still there. So, um, you know, we still had a cash flowing asset there and we, you know, we had a nice financial cushion to get us through. So, and thankfully the rents, people were still paying rent and, you know, we didn't lose any properties, thank goodness, you know, because we didn't have any crazy, uh, you know, loans that were going to re-amortize and triple and that kind of stuff. So, so now I, it's just from like listening to you talking, like I, I heard all single families. Is that right? Uh, we've branched out a little bit now. Seattle's a market where there aren't very many multifamilies. Okay. So it's, it's very it's, it's different than some other markets where it's yep. common to have multifamily. So you can easily buy a duplex, triplex, fourplex, whatever. Um, they're pretty rare up here. So we have one duplex. It's mostly, and we have some uh, commercial. We've got a couple of vacation rentals that are single family and uh, even some land, um, which it's hard to get rent off of land, but we do have one that we rent out and get some cash flow. We rent it as a construction yard. So it's just kind of a matter of just kind of being open-minded about different opportunities that come along. And uh, um, I have certain criteria that when I see certain things that fit a certain profile, I kind of go, okay, this might be a possibility for us. And 
I found that as time goes on, I'm more open to different kinds of properties and different, uh, it's all about like upside and um, location for me. Mm -hmm. So, and I am, I have been really hooked on the high, the high appreciation. So for me, it's cash flow is important, of course, but um, I'm more appreciation focused. And I know I differ from a lot of people in that, but that's worked fantastically well for us over the years. You know, you talk about the one house, it's like that was 750 from one house. It's like, well, what if you have 15 houses, you know, look at that. So it's just like, well, you know, you know yeah. I think, it de- I think it depends where you geographically live. Yeah. So I think like, you know, I talk to people that, you know, live in the Midwest or they live in Florida or they live in like areas where the appreciation is almost nothing. You know, it's, I mean, I guess a lot of areas have appreciated a lot, but they're slower and steadier. And over the course of 20 years, that $200,000 property, maybe that's worth 300 in a market like that. Um, I'm in Boston, you're in Seattle. We're in two of the bigger appreciating markets like yeah. in the country. And so I think for people that don't look at appreciation, it might be because they're in a market where they haven't gotten that benefit. Um, right. One thing that you said that I think people struggle with too is like, well, like I can see myself purchasing my first property. I can get a down payment save for my first one. How do I get my second, my third, my fourth? And a simple thing like that you mentioned, but I think it's important when people start to think about like, how do I accumulate a rental property portfolio is those lines of credit. And those lines of credit are easier to get when your property's worth double what, you know, and that's where the appreciation definitely plays in and some markets where, you know, it happens. Yeah. But by now, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, were any of those properties like cash flow negative? No. Um, that first one I bought, I think, was cash flow negative for a little while. Yeah. We have bought a couple yeah. years ago when we were getting started that might be a couple hundred dollars a month cash flow Mm -hmm. negative. Um, and you always have to be really careful when doing that. You know, like we made sure we always have a lot of, you know, enough reserves to cover any circumstance, you know, and I hear a lot of people tell me like, well, what if all your houses are empty? It's like, well, that's literally never happened in 20 years, you know, and I don't, you know, but if, if a couple of them are empty, you know, that's okay. We'll survive. You know, you gotta have, you know, resources to cover that. But, Mm um, um, yeah, but it's, it's right, which is, you know, definitely if I was in a market that didn't have the appreciation, then of course, cash flow would make a lot more sense. Um, and if it gets to a point where I'm going to retire later and I, if I want to, you know, we could sell some of these ones that maybe, who knows, we could sell a house or two and buy something at cash flows wonderfully somewhere else. Yep. I don't know. And just live off that cash flow. It's kind of cool just to have the options, you know. So, but right, right now, I'm in a phase in my life where I don't need the cash flow as much. Yep. I'm just looking at building the portfolio, and then later we can shuffle around and redistribute, maybe ex- explore some other markets. So far, I've been pretty adamant about just like staying in our local market. Yep. We did venture out once, and we bought two houses in New Orleans right before Hurricane Katrina, and that was a bit of a bad experience. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, yeah. a whole other podcast there but whoa that was crazy so uh I'm like well okay maybe we'll just kind of stick to our lane here you know it seems to be going pretty well where we are so yeah yeah so you now we talked a lot about the investing side of your business how has the agent side kind of tied in oh yeah so as agents it's perfect because we are, uh, you know, right in the thick of it. So, so myself, so for my, just give a brief recap of myself and my business. So I, I run a small team outside of Seattle. We sell about $65 million of real estate a year. And, um, so it's myself and two other agents and two admin, that's kind of our business structure. And we work in the suburbs of Seattle, people that, you know, like the people that commute to say Amazon and Microsoft, and that's just kind of our, our, uh, our zone. And, um, so, um, as far as, so being a real estate agent gives us the perfect opportunity for investing. Number one, we know it, we're, we're in it, you know, we, we understand it and hopefully it doesn't feel as scary as it might for other people. We spot opportunities when they come along because I'm up to my eyeballs in the MLS like every single day combing through properties. 
I find some things off market, but honestly, most of my, almost every deal I've done has been on the MLS. And sometimes people find that hard to believe, but there are gems in there. If you just know how to recognize it when you see it. And the only way to know that is to just be really in it every yeah. single day to where you notice these weird anomalies like, oh, this one's marketed strange. This one yep. has some big problems. And I see the big problems and I'm like, oh, like I saw one the other day, somebody posted on one of our local realtor, you know, one of the local realtor Facebook groups. Somebody's like, wow, look at this disaster of a house. And I'm like, oh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Water is yeah. in it. It's a short sale. It's like crazy, you know, things that I would, that would even a few years ago, I might've been like, I don't know if I would take this one on. I actually put an offer in on it and I'll find out today if we're going to get it. I'm just like, if the price is right, I'll take on almost any problem. Yep. So and if we can solve those problems, huge upside. So if that works out on that deal, I could easily do some renovations and uh, double the value. You know, if we're able to, we just got to deal with the, you know, the issues in the meantime and put up with the inconvenience. So, and also being resourceful, you know, like finding ways to source cash, you know, like this, some of the more funky deals you can't purchase with regular financing. So you have to have other financing options in place. So um, you know, that's another thing, like definitely as you get more advanced, it's better to have more, you know, advanced resources and skill sets to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, I like, yeah. you know, the, the, on the MLS thing is interesting because like people always say you can't get a deal on the MLS. Um, but really like, I know it is definitely more difficult and I will be completely honest. I buy almost like if, if I buy 150 houses in a year, like 148 are off the MLS. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my business model. But um, there's always, once something hits the MLS, like, like you said, it's like, is it marketed right? Mm -hmm. And I have, a, I have a close friend who buys a lot on the market in my market. And what he does is he, he knows the zoning in certain areas. And what he'll look for, and this is just an example, but what he'll look for is he knows in a certain area it's zone, right now, if it's a single family, you can always get a two there. And what he finds a lot of times is that it just gets marketed as a single family because the realtor who lists it has no idea. And a lot of times even the seller has no idea. And so he goes in and sometimes he says, you know, people think I'm crazy for what I, I paid for the property, but they don't know what I know that I can do with it. So yes, that's uh, brilliant. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it was funny because like, that was literally after I made a comment, like that you can't get deals on the MLS. And he was like, wait a second. Uh, that's <laughs> like, that's not really true. And, and I started thinking about it and I'm like, I've been saying this for a long time, but it really, it, it really can't be hundred percent true because you just never know what is going to be on. But like you mentioned, you've got to be on it. Like you've got to be on looking all the time. Yeah. And you have to be ready to act quickly. And so like that offer I put in, you know, that I hope, I don't know, I'll find out today if we got it or not. It's like, it was a low offer, but it's cash as is like, yep, we'll take it all of it. You know, we can't see it first. Okay, fine. You know, we're just going to make certain assumptions about it. Um, easy, leave the junk, you know, like all the stuff, it's just like easy, easy, easy cash. Here's why we're experienced and we were ready. We're the right people for the job. Like you have to make the case, you know? Yep. Um, and, you know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But um, it really is true also just like being aware of your market. If you know your market really, really well, like your friend does, like there's a certain um, area where there was an up zone, like you were talking about, mm -hmm. where it's zoned to, to put townhomes in, you know, and uh, we went and bought like three, four properties in that area in a year. And still, I don't think most people even are aware that that up zone ever happened because it's just exactly. never was talked about. And I'm like, wow, here's, yeah, I'm like, no, okay, there's no like. Up. There's yeah. no like, you know, balloon that goes over the neighborhood yeah. and, and makes the announcement. <laughs> yeah. So I think even a lot of agents don't know about it. And like, you want the ones that like the regular home buyers aren't going to want. Like um, one that we bought was like, what, that had that zoning. It was like, you know, on the highway and it had no picture, one horrible picture, you know, and this wasn't very appealing, but I'm looking at it going like, oh, there's development potential here down the road, even though we're not going to do developing for a while, but it's like, it's just there, you know, and there's a renter paying for in the meantime. Um, and uh, your orb ones are like, there was another one we bought in that same zoning area where it was like, 
gutted, you know? And so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, it doesn't, does not qualify for regular financing. Perfect. Yeah. You know, cash offer as is we'll take it. You know, we just, uh, for that one, we just, I have a large line of credit on our primary residence and I just did a burr on it. You know, I just pulled the money out, you know, bought it, fixed it, refied, paid ourselves back. Now we have a great property with upside in the future. Mm-hmm. Other people were like, well, it doesn't even have a bathroom. Like, how are you going to do Like, you just put one in, you know, it's like, you just have to have the, you, know, you just have to have the plan and the ability to do it. And you, and you do have to ha- be ready to strike quickly because any of these deals I mentioned, even the funky ones, like they do tend to go fast and you have to get in before other people realize that it's there. So, so now you, you kind of quickly rifled off your aging stacks, very impressive stacks. Uh, 60 million is definitely nothing to like, you know, messing around with. My question for you, and I get this from people that are selling a lot less than 60 million is like, well, I don't have time to invest in and be an agent. So how are you pulling off the two? Uh, for me, there's very, it, it, there's the lines blur. Um, well, number one, it's like, that's, that's, exactly, I, that's exactly the answer I wanted. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't it's have the same you job. Better. I feel like it's the yep. same job. I'm just it doing it for myself job. rather than for somebody else. So there's really no difference. Uh, only it's, I get a lot more excited when I see an opportunity for myself. I get excited for all my clients. Right. But, you know, but, um, but I see something for me, it's like, this is what I do when I'm not working. You know, it's like, if I was like not working at all, this, I would be out hunting deals and finding houses and fixing them because it's fun. So. Exactly. I mean, that's why like literally the the, the show's agent investor, like the book I have coming out is agent investor. And it's like, to me, like, when people, when people try to like segment them, I'm like, I don't know how you would, like, it's the same, you're doing the same things. I mean, um, like you said, I mean, you know, you're looking for a deal for a client or for yourself, or you're always looking, you're always active. You're always learning about the market. You're trying to figure out ways to do things. I mean, I don't know, like, you know, how it's, how it's really much different, but um, so I, I love that answer. The, so the other thing is you talked about some creative ways to finance, um, and I don't know what you're going to say to this, but um, you talked about obviously burring, you talked about like pulling equity on, on some rental properties. Like, um, have you done any other sort of like creative financing at all? So I have not super creative. I have done a little bit of, um, there's some people who get really, really creative with it. Yep. And I love that. Um, you know, sometimes we just do the old fashioned way, just put our own money in, you know, like when you sell real estate. And, you know, sometimes we get some really great, you know, commission income Yep. and we always, you know, we live well, I'm not going to say that we're like, you know, living any life of like, you know, deprivation or anything like that, but, you know, we, we definitely live below our means. And so, you know, I, and because this is a passion of mine too, I'd say probably over half my income like goes into real estate investing at least, you know, Mm -hmm. so because we're always looking for the next opportunity. And it's, it's funny, like even now when people are saying the market's so crazy, I've seen so many opportunities this in the last like three weeks. I was just like, oh, I wish I could just like buy all of them because they're all exciting. But um, uh, so I put, um, to get back to your question, Tom, I put, we put our own money in the old fashioned mm-hmm. way. Um, and we also, um, so you, we, we have lines of credit. I have done some seller financing on certain deals Um, a little bit of private financing too. Like I found a couple of people that are open to that. Um, and then also, uh, let's see, private financing, our own money, lines of credit, seller financing. I guess that's all the ones I've done have been that, um, but more and more we self finance as much as possible. And then, you know, good old conventional financing too. I mean, you can get regular loans on most houses, you know, so you can get up to 10 conform, you know, conventional loans. And some people, if they're married, they split off and like one, one person, one spouse gets 10 and then the other spouse gets 10. We haven't done that, but I mean, you can get a quite a big portfolio, just the the, the regular old fashioned way, the way the ones you need, the creative financing option are on the ones that don't qualify for regular financing, which usually are the most, uh, interesting potential deals I have found. So like the ones where they're just like a wreck and they don't, you know, an underwriter wouldn't approve the loan. So. So you mentioned you've done uh, some private money. Now is that just like friends and family and stuff? Yeah. Friends and family. Yeah. 
So yeah. And I know not everybody has that. Um, but I know a lot of people that do like get creative with building out their network with private, you know, finding partners for private funding and doing deals with partners. Sometimes you bring the partner in as a equity partner and as well as the financial side of it. I, we haven't done that so far. We've done everything without partners, but I mean, it's certainly a great way to scale. Yeah. Um, we haven't, we haven't done that yet, but, um, usually but for me, the private financing has been more for like a stepping stone, mm -hmm. you know, like just to get us through the door. Yep. And then, um, and then we find some kind of like conventional financing to, you know, pay them back and move on. And then you can kind of recycle that money too. Cause if it works out well for them where it's like a win-win and they can see that, okay, best going to follow through. We know this is going to work. And then the next time, and they make some money and we make some money and then we find the next one. It's like, okay, let's do it again. And you know, there's a decent chance that they will. So. Yeah. And the advantage that everybody has right now that's trying to raise private capital is, okay, well, what's some of these options if they've got $200,000 in the bank? Well, you can put it in a CD, you can put it in a bond, you can put it in the bank and you can basically get nothing. Um, you can put it in the stock market, which as we're, you know, sitting right now, probably seemed like a really good idea going back a few years, but not everybody likes the right. stock market and mm -hmm. the stock market as of this second, you know, feels kind of high. Um, so where else can you get like a guaranteed return on an asset class that like everybody knows? So we, we've done a bunch of that. I've never seller finance. That's one thing I've never done. Um, I've done a lot of creative financing, but never seller. I never needed to. And, and yeah. actually, in most cases, the seller has sold to me because they want to be out. Um, right. So how did you pull that one off? What did that deal look like? Yeah, so that was kind of a weird one. The only land one that we bought is an investment. It's in the area when that, that up zone area I was talking about, there was a piece of land in a good, really good location popped up. And it was a, uh, it was being sold as vacant land. And it was a um, construction yard. And my husband being in construction, I was like, hey, you like this construction yard? Kind of interesting, you know? They're asking, I think, 149000 for this lot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, this is interesting because we could build on it later. It's across from the park and the river. Like, this could be a good location. And um, or in the meantime, you just keep it like it is and just park your stuff there. You know, like that's kind of cool, too. And so then we just kind of did the math on like, you know, if we were going to have uh, like people do RV parking there or something, you know, because like there's actually quite a bit of money in that. And we ultimately ended up just renting it out to a landscaper who just pays us to park all our stuff there because there's very few places you can do that around our area. However, how the how the deal ended up being structured was um, I just called the agent. We talked about it. You know, I said, you know, would they be open to seller financing? And he's like, yeah, they would. So um, we just put something together. Um, what was that? I think it was like 4% interest or something like that. And uh, I think it was like 10 year, it was like interest only for 10 years. And then like a balloon payment, you have to pay it off or something like that. I, can't I, remember. I love that I, you're doing like all of these super impressive things, but just like, it's like casual, like, yeah, we just decided that we were going to see if they would sell a finance. And then they said, yeah. And then it's just like, the, <laughs> all, all of your stories kind of just seem like that. Like, it's just funny. I know. I know. And it's kind of, that would have maybe intimidated me at one point, but now it's a sort of like, well, you know, you just, I just feel, I just felt it out, you know, and the agent was kind of a creative minded person, you know, and I could tell he was a little green, but a good person. And, uh, and the sellers are cool people too. You know, they were landscapers just looking to sell their lot. This was right before COVID happened and all that stuff. So this wanted some cash. Oh, and there, this has an interesting wrinkle to it too. So we bought the place for, I think it, we paid, oh, I forget. I think we paid like a hundred and, I think we paid 130 for it. Mm -hmm. And then we had this note on it, right? And it was, and there's people that go around that buy notes you know, there's people whose business model is buying private notes. Mm -hmm. And so I got a notice from one of those people that like, hey, we're buying this note. And I was like, what? So I, uh, and granted, it would have been fine to just, it just same terms, just transfer over to this other company or whatever. Um, so I called the seller, the, you know, the person who did the financing, the former owner, you know, and I'm like, what's going on here? What did they offer you? 
And he said they offered him like, I don't know, like $75,000 or something for their note. Mm. And I was like, uh, dude, we'll give you, you know, sell it to us for, you know, 90 and, you know, we'll, we'll just, we'll just pay you, we'll just buy it out for 90, you know, even yeah. though we owed, like, I forget what it was. It, basically we got another like 30 grand out of it just by paying more than what the note buyer was going to pay. Does that make sense? I know that kind of got a little bit vague there, but. No, um, it, it made, it made yeah. perfect sense. So you had a note for 120, you said? Yeah, I think it was okay. some, sorry, I should, I should have this. <laughs> it was something like that. It was about 120. Yeah, Somebody so, was going to so, buy it for pennies oh, on the dollar. So yeah. somebody basically like cash offered his note basically and said like yeah. if, if you want to get the money today i'll yeah. take over the payments yeah yeah that's and this was right when COVID hit and everything was shut down in washington and we didn't even know how we were even going to finish this and i just had my my uh title person who helps us out with everything i had a legal thing drawn up so you gotta have your team right so i had a lawyer, lawyer drew up an agreement uh, everybody agreed on it and I had to pay out, they had already obligated themselves to this note buyer. So I had to pay the note buyer 2,500 bucks to break the, their deal. Yep. Um, but it was worth it. And they had like, Hey, they made 2,500 bucks for nothing. They did good. Yeah. So they were happy. Yeah. Um, and then I just, I met them. I remember I've been about in like the, you know, supermarket parking lot. Cause we couldn't meet inside. Everything was closed. <laughs> we just signed on the hood of our cars, you know, and I gave them a cashier's check for whatever the balance due was. And they just signed the, the, the deed to reconvey the deed of trust or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then my, uh, escrow person went and recorded it. So it's like, you gotta make sure it's all done le legitimately. Right. So we can sell it with clear title and all that. So you just gotta have, but as agents, we know how to do that. Right. So it's like, you know, we knew what to do. I knew what to do and I had the right person to do it. And it was tough because everything was closed. It was like a year ago when everything was like scary and shut down, but these people, they just needed money. They did their business was shut down and they didn't, uh, have the luxury of getting these payments every month. They just needed the, the cash, you know? So we're like, great, here's cash. So, mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, it's like, we got it, it's paid off and uh, somebody pays a thousand dollars a month to rent this uh, construction yard. And the taxes are like $300 a year and there's no CapEx, there's like a fence, that's it. Fence and mm -hmm. a gate, you know? So it's actually a really good rental property. So. Yeah. And someday maybe we'll build something there because there's that too. You know, like that's what originally drew me to it. It was like, oh, this is in an area where you could build townhouses or some sort of mixed use building. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that was a little more interesting. That was one of the more creative ones we did. And um, one of my favorite too, you know, yeah. it's a, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the ROI on that one seems pretty crazy. So I know. Yeah. So obviously like you've done a lot, right? So say again, going back 20 years, like you've done a lot as an agent, you've done a lot as an investor, like just so like people can kind of get an understanding of like the, the value of investing and just, you know, to make conversation here, like you've earned a lot as an agent, you've earned a lot, you know, growing your net worth as an investor, like which of those two do you think you gain more from? If you definitely had as an investor, definitely as an investor. So Cause if, if, you know, we don't have any retirement plans. I know you talk about that a lot on the show, but it's like, as an agent, like you got to find a way to make the money, your make money for, to retire. Yeah. So, and, um, you know, otherwise you'd be working until you die and I don't want to work until I love my job, but I don't want to work until I die. And so, um, yeah, investing has, uh, been exponentially more profitable than the, and I've done really well in real estate. So it's that's not what like I'm saying. Real that's my point. And that's, yeah. and that's typically what, and imagine like, you know, for, for the people that are listening that, you know, are, are selling a lot less, how much more that kind of multiplier would be. Um, and let me ask you one more question before I set you up for kind of my last thing is um, what have you spent more time doing? Helping people buying or selling properties hours wise or investing? Definitely helping people, helping my clients buy and sell takes a lot more of my time than yep. the investing side of it. So you're queuing me up for the last thing. So for the people that are here, they're selling real estate, they're listening, that like haven't gone into investing yet, like going back to like your, you know, your past self, like what would you say to somebody like that that's either scared or they don't think they can do it or whatever? I would say give yourself, give yourself some credit. 
you know it's like you can handle it Mm -hmm. things will happen that will challenge you embrace that challenge because that's how you learn and you grow and even if you mess up a little bit it makes a good story later and we all need good stories and it's just it just gets started you know people get so scared and i was scared too yep i was too it took me like five years to do my first yeah (laughs) <laughs> right so yeah. you know and like it's it is scary but you can do it and once you get the feeling like just like anything scary you start doing it even like, like going on a podcast or any kind of thing that might be like a little bit scary for some people it's like you just you do it and you realize like oh okay that actually wasn't bad and then you can do push a little further do a little bit more you need to get a little bit comfortable being uncomfortable and that's true in real estate sales as and investing um just yeah, I know it's easy to say, like, just do it. It's so simple and cliche, but it's, I mean, it really is true. It's like, just get out there and do it. Um, You'll find that you're stronger than you think you are. And it's not going to be as hard as you think it is. Build your team. Like if you're worried, like, I don't think I can handle property management, get a property manager. Yeah. You know, I managed it myself for years and now I realize I'm a terrible property manager. And so just like, I don't want to deal with that anymore. And I don't, you know, it's just like, oh, I don't know how to deal with the legal stuff. Find an attorney that can help you if you've got something complicated, you know, you got your title and escrow people or, you know, lawyers, depending on what state you're in, just, you know, tap into that network, use it. Um, And uh, if you, you know, I would say that everyone has, there's always real estate meetup groups, you know, these days it tends to be more like Zoom or whatever, but people are starting to meet up again in person. It's just like, get involved with other investors in the area. And in most people who are successful are more than happy to help out people who are looking to be successful. Cause I can tell you like myself, like I love helping people who want to get started in investing in my real world. Like I don't bring it up that much because a lot of people don't really want to hear about it, you know? So it's like, and it drives me crazy because I just want to tell everybody, you know, but I learned a long time ago, like you got to just kind of keep that close. And if somebody shows interest, then I'm just like, Oh, please, you know, allow me to help you, you know? And so it feels good to help people. So there's people out there that are looking to um, share their knowledge, you know, people who are, you know, a, have an abundance mindset who want to help other people succeed. I love so it. I would just say, find those people, you know, like I was lucky that I had that one person way back when that kind of showed me the way there was no, you know, social media or any of this stuff back then you know so it had to happen more organically you know but nowadays it's there's no excuse you can tap into people anywhere across the country it's it's crazy there's no excuse now there's so many facebook groups there's so many ways to reach out to people and like you mentioned um you'd be surprised like if you found in your market like the top five people who you want to emulate and you reach out to five i think you'd be surprised how many of those five will get back to you and even if only one gets back to you, that's all you need to get started. Yeah. Um, so I love it. Well, I want to thank you for jumping on, you know, sharing all your knowledge. You've done some impressive things already. I'm sure you're going to do a, a lot more going forward. Uh, so I appreciate you coming on. And um, if listeners want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get to you? Yeah. So um, I'm on Facebook quite a bit. So if you just type, you know, type in my name, Beth Traverso on Facebook, you'll find me. Um, or my website, bethtraverso.com is a good way to find me too. So in either one of those day, ways is a good way to reach out. Awesome. So, yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank you again. And uh, guys, we'll be back uh, next week again with another Asian Investor podcast. So thank you for tuning in.